I'm Luna, by the way. I work for the Tacoma Tree Foundation, and I'm very excited about this presentation today. <laughs> Coming to terms of where where we are and how do we see the land that we're on and the relationship that we have with it, because if um, and this quote kind of speaks to that, I think of if we see land as a commodity or as like a thing we can just buy and use, then we'll treat it differently than if we see it as like a community that we're a part of that we want to steward and be in good relation with. Um, and another part of where we are is that we are in Tacoma, which is historically Puyallup land and Puyallup territory. And that's been stewarded um, in good relation for a really long time. And I think having the knowledge of like how, how we came to be on this land is uh, comes with the responsibility of this is something that we need to heal and hopefully be in better relation with and care for the land and all our relatives that live here. But our main event for today is introducing Lowell Wise, <laughs> um, who is our lovely presenter today. Um, they are a board member for our uh, Tacoma Tree Foundation, and they have a PhD in American literature, which is pretty cool. Um, and they also <laughs> just published a book, which is also super cool, and I just found this out this morning, um, called Ecospatiality. So definitely check that out. That's super rad. Um, but yeah, welcome, uh, and I'm gonna let you take it from here. Thank you, Luna. <clears throat> Thanks to Tacoma Tree Foundation. It's really great to be here. Nice to see everybody in the audience, even though I can't see your faces. A lot of familiar, friendly names out there. And um, yeah, I would also just like to thank Luna for that land acknowledgement. And I would also like to say that I'm also coming from um, Puyallup and Coast Salish territory. And um, just acknowledge the the stewardship that um, the Puyallup people have as our neighbors, and um, ac across time as well. So, um, as Luna said, my name is Lowell. I um, I have a PhD in American literature from Loyola University Chicago, and I'm also on the board of Tacoma Tree Foundation. Um, most of you are, I think, coming from Tacoma, which makes sense. And I would um, like to give you a few things to think about today, not just specifically related to Tacoma, where we are, but also um, more generally. And I wanna talk to you about the philosophy of place and sort of how that has a, a basis for environmental action. Okay, so the subject of today's talk is you are here. <clears throat> and my plan for today is to try to make this a little bit reflective and interactive. And um, I am gonna be giving you some kind of information in sort of a lecture section um, related somewhat to my research, but um, kind of expanding out from that as well. And, um, and after that, we'll have a chance for some question and answers. So um, this is my book. <laughs> I received the first copy of my book the other day in the mail, so it does exist and it's available um, online starting, I think next month. So anyway, um, this is based on my PhD research and um, I wrote most of this book actually in Tacoma. So I, I'm from the Midwest, but I moved to Tacoma in 2014 after um, completing my PhD coursework in Chicago and uh, moved here while I was, um, writing this project that, that became this book. And then I was also doing some work in local environmental policy and sustainability. So I worked at the city of Tacoma for a year and a half in the sustainability office, later moved to the Sustainable Tacoma Commission, which oversees the city's work in sustainability. And then I started an organization called uh, Tacoma Needs Trees or a local initiative rather to call attention to the urban forest. So this was happening kind of at the same time I was doing all this research and I'll come back to those things. Um, but I want to start us off with kind of an activity. And um, this is gonna be the subject of the first part of our session. So the question that we have here is what is place? And it might sound sort of obvious, right? I think it's something that we take for granted actually to be thinking about what, you know, what place is. We know what our city's called, we know where we're from, where we are in general, but I don't think we always appreciate the, the depth that actually is involved in this. 
And this relates to my thinking about place for a number of reasons, but I'm especially interested because I study literature in the connection between places and stories. And there's a, there's a kind of way in which, um, right, we could, rather than have a word cloud or just a list in the chat, we could have these names appear on a map, or we might have like a mental map of these places ourselves. Someone mentioned um, uh, New York City, and I, I have a bunch of memories and associations from my own trips to New York City and books that I've read about New York City. And so um, you can kind of think about this, the mapping function of these place names. And this can also get really, um, really localized too. So when we think about Tacoma, for those of us who are here, um, it can get more specific, right, than Tacoma when we start thinking about Hilltop and we start thinking about East Side and different parts of the city. So I'm gonna um, introduce a few ideas. And what I want you to do is to think in the back of your mind uh, about those places that you mentioned, those three or four places that you mentioned as significant to you, because I, I think that's gonna be the basis for how you um, receive the information that I'm gonna talk about today, um, because ultimately place is very personal, I think. So I'm gonna walk through a few kind of definitions and things, and then we'll keep going. Um, so as I was doing research for my dissertation and my book, um, I, I had to try to answer this question to define place. And I really latched onto this definition from a sociologist named E.V. Walter in a book called Placeways. And he says that the totality of what people do think and feel in a specific location gives identity to a place. And through its physique and morale, it shapes a reality which is unique to places different from the reality of an object or a person. Human experience makes a place, but a place lives in its own way. A place is a matrix of energies, generating representations and causing changes in awareness. Uh, this is my favorite definition that I've encountered, and there are others from uh, scholars of place and space and geography. Um, but what I, really, what I really like here is the attention to physique and morale. So place is something very physical. Um, I talk about it as something that's eco-spatial, so kind of combining ecology and geography to have a sense of eco-spatiality, but that's kind of a more physical definition. And I think it's important to remember that place also has this social dimension, this what morale uh, that Walter's calling it. So it's like how human experience actually makes places and then um, this idea that a place is a matrix of energies. So it's often, I mean, it's constantly changing, constantly developing in motion, but um, we've got these relationships and connections to it. So this is kind of a more academic definition for you to keep in mind. Physique and morale, place as a matrix. Uh, here's my simplified version. I talk about place as a combination of nature, space, and story. And so by nature, I think um, I'm talking about the, the natural ecology, the, the living world, the, the more than human world that surrounds us in a city, you know, thinking about the urban forest, thinking about urban ecology. Um, but there are different definitions of nature as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, by space, I mean geography. Um, where things are in relation to each other, spatial relationships. That to me has a really, um, a really key uh, component as well. And then the final one is story. And that's the more social dynamic or the social element of place. So I would say that we can't really understand a place until we have some sense of what has happened there over time or what is happening or, or where is it going. So. Um, Keep this in mind as a kind of simpler definition, but nature, space, and story. Um, when we're doing this, it, it matters uh, local and global. So the scale matters when we talk about a place. Um, I think my living room where I'm sitting is a place, but I'm also in a certain neighborhood, in a certain city, in a certain county, et cetera, a bioregion, watershed. Um, 
place is something that's physical and out there in the world, but it's also in our heads too. So um, it's something that, that we relate to emotionally. And you could think there's an objective place, um, but I think that different people's experiences of that place really matter too. Another thing, kind of more academic, place and nature are also what we call discourse. They're examples of ideas that change over time. And I'll just give you an example. Um, I think in, in this place, um, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a difference between um, a sense of nature that includes people in, and kind of in a classical Western definition, uh, for some reason, uh, people have separated themselves from nature and tried to see themselves as above nature or uh, caring for nature rather than included. And, and I think that has uh, high stakes for, um, for our general orientation to place and our understanding of our place in the world. So keep in mind that those are words that change meanings over time. Um, another thing is that place is political. And so questions of who claims ownership, who decides what happens and why, and then also whose stories are represented. These are really, really important questions. And then finally, a thing that I like to say is that places reflect our values, whether we like it or not. So um, where we live is sort of a reflection of who we are. And um, I think this is a really key question when it comes to uh, being environmental caretakers and, and also being good neighbors. And so I want to challenge everybody here to think about um, how places reflect your values and which of those are sort of the values that you want to have reflected and which of them you might want to change or might want to work on. So um, just as a way of giving you some more background, this is a, a really influential book for me. It's a book called Prairie Earth by the author William Least Heat Moon. And this is a book about place and about mapping and travel. And just to give you a little background on it, um, Heat Moon uh, became famous for a book he wrote called Blue Highways, where he traveled around the country on back roads and kind of wrote about small town and rural America. Uh, this was his follow-up book where he decided to concentrate and, and spend his time in a certain county in Kansas. And the idea was that Kansas has this, this reputation, this stereotype for being empty and kind of lacking life and lacking experience. And so he Moon set out and wrote a book about it uh, based on his travels there in a very small county or, or a county with not very large population but it's actually the heart of the tall grass prairie bioregion. So um, this book is about how he dug into this place, explored it, um, it looked in every corner, read every story he could get his hands on, went down into the archives of the courthouse to really excavate the place. And, and so that's what he's talking about when he's talking about writing as mapping. And, and also the subtitle for this book is A Deep Map. I guess it got cut off on my PowerPoint, but Prairie Earth, a deep map. So um, deep mapping is uh, kind of a, a literary genre that this guy created. Um, and I would say it's kind of a subset of something that we call literary cartography. And this is the idea that really grabbed a hold of me in my research. Um, what does it mean to, for a story to map a place or how is a book like a map? So for that discussion, um, you'll have to talk to me uh, privately or, or have a different chat because I want to focus more on the social dimension today. But this is more uh, background for you and a really cool book for you to check out. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this part, but there's three kind of things that I think about with relationships between place and stories. There's a, a way that, that stories produce places as kind of that element of place. Um, they depict it like in literature where in, when you have a memory of a place just from having read something and then they also kind of mediate place for us so we we use stories to understand um, where we are in the world along those lines since most of you are in Tacoma I'll share this image with you this is a, a kind of 
word map thing, as you can tell, uh, created by an artist um, that I thought was really interesting. So this is Tacoma represented in words. So since I was exploring this idea of um, defining place and digging into it, um, I was looking for examples. And so this is just something to kind of get your thinking going as well. Um, so here's a few terms that are sort of important in, in the area that I'm talking about, this overlap between academic place studies and then environmental action. So um, eco-spatiality, that's the term that I sort of coined. Um, a sense of place is something that you'll often hear. Um, and having a sense of place or uh, environmentalists love to use this as well. So thinking about um, oh, that, that place really had a, a strong sense of place. What, what does that mean? Um, it kind of means that it's, it's memorable for some reason. It stands out to you. But there's also a, a sense of place that could be sort of lacking or, uh, I don't know, an empty sense of place, something like that. So um, environmental history is something I think about a lot cultural perspectives, place making, um, and especially this, um, this idea of multiple perspectives, multiple cultural perspectives that I was talking about before. Um, this is kind of a central tenet for me of talking about place that you can't just have a single perspective on the place. You have to make an effort to understand what other people think about it. And so coming from, this comes a little bit from William Lee's Heat Moon's book that I just mentioned. Um, Heat Moon talks a lot about this value of different perspectives on a place. And I think you can imagine this based on, um, you know, your own perceptions versus your neighbors. Um, different cultures have a completely different understanding of uh, particular places based on what has happened to their, what their cultural history might be. And so um, if you really want to understand place kind of in its entirety in more of a comprehensive way, you have to seek out other perspectives. So that's uh, something I will stand by. That's an essential, essential piece. Um, so to kind of uh, bring this into the environmental action realm, um, moving from awareness to action, I talk a lot in my book and in general about having this awareness of place. And what does awareness of place um, require of us? But then what does it sort of make you do? Um, and, and how can it possibly lead to more action in these, in these areas? Uh, this is a tweet that I saw just last week. And I just love this tweet. It really spoke to me. Um, just choosing to walk in your city will radicalize you. I really resonate with this because this was kind of my experience in moving to Tacoma um, and experiencing a city for the first time as a newcomer, learning about it, um, walking around town, thinking about the environmental priorities. Um, it's a beautiful place to be and to experience, but then there are also these kind of gaps where um, certain places aren't as as fun to be in for some reason, or um, yeah, just, just walking and getting to know the place. And that was part of my own um, process, I guess. This idea that I see in this tweet that walking in your city will radicalize you, I suspect this guy is coming from a transportation background. Um, I don't know who Steven is, but um, I think the idea is, you know, connectivity with sidewalks and, um, you know, what do you see when when you walk around, when you experience your, your hyper-local place where you are. Um, and so I think this is a little bit about car culture versus uh, pedestrian experiences, but um, I think it has a broader implication as well. So the idea that I see here is to start local, local start at a hyper-local level, get a local sense of place, and then uh, try to radiate outward and see what kind of action uh, results from that. So you can get a lot of information just by walking around and experiencing things on the ground. And then what does that make you think about? What does that make you do? So um, this is a map of Tacoma's tree canopy. It's a few years old now, uh, probably from uh, five or six years ago. Um, 
But uh, this is a, a map that became important to me as I was um, studying the environmental policies that Tacoma has, and then also thinking about how to start to make an impact. So this is a, a visual about the distribution of tree canopy in the city. And you can see that it's not equally distributed, right? Some places are more green than others. Um, my own neighborhood has something like a 5% tree canopy rather than uh, the 30% the that the city says it's aiming for. So um, it's become kind of one of my goals and one of the reasons I have joined the Tree Foundation to start to correct this, to, to have a more lively and healthy urban forest that, um, that also takes care of the community by giving us all these benefits like clean air and clean water and shade when it gets really hot. So um, this is another thing, just kind of a touchstone uh, visual to keep in mind for today. Um, I'm going to try not to go into trees too much because <laughs> I want to focus on the, the bigger issue for now. Um, what I want to talk about with this connection to action is um, what I call in my book an ethic of place. So how do we develop an ethic of place? And I guess like a sense of place, an ethic of place could be positive or negative. Um, but I think that it combines uh, care for the environment with a sense of social justice. So going back to that definition of uh, place, it's, it's combining the physical aspect of the environment with the social aspect of environment, recognizing that people live here, that different communities experience places differently, um, and then aiming to have an ethic of place that connects those things. Um, and I think that for me, that boils down to this value of environmental justice, creating more fairness in the, in the actual places where we live, um, making sure that the environment is giving out these benefits to people in a more equal kind of way. And there's a lot more we could say about the you know, the distribution of the tree canopy with the history of, of racism and infrastructure and so on. But I think the basic fact for me is that um, because of the way that cities are built, they are built to benefit certain people more than others. Just because we live in a, an unequal society, this is just part of the, the structure of it. So um, structural racism actually gets built into our environments. And environmental justice is a movement that's working on correcting that. And by the way, I really love that the Tree Foundation has a connection to environmental justice and is thinking about things through these, this lens. So moving on, um, I have a few kind of suggestions. Here's another um, map of Tacoma uh, that I like from a few years ago. Um, but thinking about cultivating a practice of place, one thing I would just encourage everyone to think about is um, what does it mean to you to experience a place. How do you do that? What does it mean in a physical sense, in an emotional sense, uh, communal sense? And then uh, kind of using that as a, as a springboard, developing a practice. For me, being here, um, what it means is uh, I do a lot of walking. I do a lot of uh, travel, like I would call it slow travel, like exercise combined with uh, paying attention to things. And so, um, yeah, there's different, different things you can do to just kind of maintain that awareness of where you are. So here's a few suggestions. First of all, I think it's really important to learn about your place. And that could mean something hyperlocal. It could mean where your place fits in with the broader geography. Um, yeah, so just keep learning about it. Be, atten be attentive to place. That means also reading, listening to stories and telling stories. So I think in that sense that stories create places, we have to keep listening to each other and learning more as we go. Uh, the next one is just exploring. So exploring the world around you in whatever way that means to you. But I think it has an observation element, an element of discovery, and then also unplugging when possible. It's great to walk around and listen to a podcast. I love doing that, but sometimes it's also great to listen to what's going on. Being a good steward of the natural world, whatever that means. Um, for me, reducing consumption of, of material things is really important, 
but then also knowing where your stuff comes from and where it goes i think that is a way of connecting you to the place where you live the food that you eat where does it come from you know that kind of thing uh finally uh be a place maker and be political um help create the kinds of places you enjoy so this is the big question that i would kind of leave you with um what kind of places are we making um there's this this movement called placemaking i think one of the ways that we see it is in in tacoma at least is in the parking bay initiative that um is sponsored by downtown on the go and other um other groups i think uh turning parking spaces into little places kind of pocket parks and so on um, but we see it in other ways as well. I would encourage you to think about that placemaking element as something that's always happening. You know, that kind of placemaking is sort of making places that are fun and good for, for some reasons, but um, place is something that's always in progress. It's always being made kind of in spite of us and because of us. And so the question is, uh, what kind of places are we making? Places are developing all the time they're constantly changing. And so what, uh, what does that mean, right? So I'm gonna kind of cut things short here in the next couple of minutes and leave some time for questions in case people have questions. Um, but I think that my, my takeaways I wanna offer you are that um, place-based practices and ethics can lead to positive change. That was kind of my experience in, um, moving to Tacoma, learning about the environmental history of the place, and, and then trying to figure out a way for that I could make a difference. Um, so for me, that ended up meaning raising awareness about the urban forest issue and what I call the, the tree canopy crisis in Tacoma. Um, Tacoma is sort of in last place among cities in the Puget Sound in terms of caring for its urban forest or the percentage of tree cover anyway. So I would really like to see that change in my lifetime. Um, so I come at that from that that kind of local experience level. And, and I wanted to see where I could make a difference. But a place-based pra practice and ethics could mean anything. It could mean something totally different for you. It could mean focusing on housing. It could mean focusing on um, criminal justice or starting a restaurant or whatever it may be. Um, but just, I would encourage people to think about the, the kind of awareness of place that they have and then let that affect how you do your work. And then this question of what kind of places we are making, I think is a really important one. But just as important is the question of whose power is reflected in the place making process. So place is always developing, it's always happening, and it's happening because certain people have the power to change it, right? Um, so that question is really important. Who's, who's in charge? Who's making the decisions that lead to uh, a low tree canopy, for example? Um, who's making the decisions about who gets to live where and whose property is worth more than, than other people's property? Um, what is happening? Who's in charge and, and what are the power dynamics? Being aware of that and being sensitive to different cultural um, cultural groups and cultural uh, voices, I think is really, really important. So this last bullet point here is um, one that I've seen kind of floating around the internet, but this question of what kind of ancestors will we be? For me, that's really based on this idea of how we relate to the places where we live, um, to what extent we choose to exert our values on the places where we live, and to what extent we're just kind of passive and, and passively floating along. Um, I think in this era that we're in with climate change and uh, what's being called the Anthropocene now, right, the age of humans, this question of what kind of ancestors will be is something that gives some people a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, how, how will, will, will we be remembered? And so um, I, I'm putting this out there as kind of a challenge to everybody to, to think more about where we are and then uh, what our legacy will be. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. That I'm, I'm still thinking about a lot of what you said and processing it, but 
and probably will be. I love the idea of just like how we use our stories to like interpret and act like physically, like it's, it's <laughs> how we see the world around us or where mm. we're at. How do you think about the interaction of individual stories within a place and the broader collective story of a place as a whole? Mm. Great question. Um, part of my thinking is that, um, is that every individual story is sort of like an entry in the archive, right? Uh, if you think about place, actually a good metaphor for place is an, an archive. So where we, where we save our stories, um, who, uh, how we access them, these are really interesting questions. I think in my case, especially when reading a book, um, sometimes a single person's story becomes the dominant story or becomes the, the only story that we have of a place. And so in that sense, individual stories are extremely powerful. Um, I think in, in, I don't know I'm making this connection, but when I read a news article about something that's going on in the city, um, it often starts with one person's story, right? So there's like this representative aspect. Okay, it's a story about gentrification, for example. Well, they're gonna interview a person on the street who's being displaced, or they're gonna interview a property developer who's doing that, right? So we use individual stories to represent the broader dynamics of what's going on. But um, my, my sense would be that the, the more stories we have, the better. So the more you can consider other perspectives and um, yeah, not just the dominant perspective, but capturing a, a range of perspectives, that's really important. There are stories of positive outcomes in an environmental sense. There are stories of, um, I don't know, political successes too, and um, things like, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking about Tacoma here, but the, the uh, Sarco smelter coming down, the cleanup of the Foss waterway. We have a lot of actual environmental victories. The, the stopping of the methanol plant a few years ago. These are pretty big things and people have showed up for them. So I think that what is usually required is to match the, the level of alarm with a level of action. So thanks for moderating, Luna. This has been really fun. Yeah, and before we go, I'm just going to put a couple links to our website and then your website. <laughs> This has this has like yeah if you if you are if you're like oh wow I learned so much there's more so if you if you want um, thanks for coming everybody.